Um, what I did take away from all three of our artists is uh, it seemed to me that they each, there's a general theme about Jing to Zhang, and that is that it, the whole experience has changed and influenced them in some ways, but each one took something very specifically different away, uh, and it, it, it shows in their work. Their works are all very different from each other. And I was just wondering if, if the three of you have ever talked together to discuss your experiences there, and if you feel the same about the city, um, or, or do you think there are specific ideas that you each took away that, that um, influenced your work? Okay. Well, we haven't talked. Have, about it, our the, have the three of you ever had a conversation <laughs> together? Well, I think I. I just did. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But it was separate. Yeah. I, what I noticed was that when you started out with, with slides that seemed very personal and were domestic, and you started out with some slides that seemed more um, commercial, and you, your slides your images had a more um, countryside kind of a, a farmland. I don't know, I'm just, I was just trying to come up with, with the experience of being in Jing and, and um, you know, I is think, there a general theme? I think part of um, what I enjoyed, you know, listening to my friends talk was reminding me of a slightly different circumstance I went to China, I think, um, was just a little bit before my 50th birthday. I actually had my 50th birthday um, riding uh, in, in a boat down the Yangtze River with a full moon. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, oh, it's my 50th birthday. I'm in China, I'm on a boat, it's the Yangtze River, there's a full moon. And um, that was just life-changing in the sense that I thought I knew something about something <laughs> and realized I didn't know anything about anything. Um, and China, not, you know, of course, the, the history and the, the romance of China, you know, this longest continuing culture on the face of the earth. But the people I met, and at the time that I first go, started going there, where some of the sense of um, possibility was beginning to enter the room and the idea of the individual could begin to have a voice. And I was just caught up in this powerful experience of people, the genuineness, the, just the sense of forthrightness and urgency and lack of cynicism, and I thought, my gosh, it's just, it's extraordinary. The courage and the tenacity and the, the sort of recent history of the country and how these, these beautiful people in this city of makers are making things. And so, you know, I learned, of course, about Jing Chen, but I learned about Wayne. I learned about Wayne Hebrew. Who is Wayne Hebrew? What does he know? You know, um, and I think my, my sense of communicating with people, my sense of teaching, my sense of what I would have to offer, but my sense of listening or paying attention became much more intense. So, you know, it's all wrapped up in this, this notion of ceramics or ceramic art, but the teachings are very deep and they're pretty profound, I think. And I felt that in in the way you presented your images, and I see it in your work. Mm. And I see a great sense of humor in your work. And I see a great um, sort of contemporary commentary on life in your work. And it's, they're different, but I, they sort of come together, the three, your, your yeah, work. Yeah, I think and the most diff different things that, that I coming from, it's uh, I'm myself Chinese. I have completely experienced that which is different from Wing Hapi. <laughs> I know, I know the language, I know the life, and if I'm not going with my husband, I may only treat as like an ordinary Chinese. You come here, you go to the bank, wait for the last. You know, my husband can get the 
priority to go first. You know, the first time I was in China in the 96. And it's really overwhelming because I also know when I'm going to China, if I'm not going with my professor, Walter Ostrom, I won't learn that much as I wanted to. I know that sounds a little kind of crazy, why it's so different from what Wing Higby uh, experience is. But this is what I understand in Confucius kind of, com it's very friend, they, they treat people outside of, the, of their own um, country are very nice and, and very generous. But they treat the people in China are very uh, disciplined and respect. And then also like they have a lot of hierarchy. So I think that this is what I've, I get my work in the kind of a postmodern kind of uh, thinking, like living in the West, born in Hong Kong, my husband is Caucasian, but learning and like Chinese culture. So like the art bring us together, but we have completely different experience. And in my work, I would struggle about who my, what is my identity. My husband doesn't want to come back to the state at all. He is still there painting and then have fun with all these people who are around. <laughs> so I think that's why it's affecting my work. A lot of artists go to Gina Jun and ask people to do work for them, but I want to insist to do my work, to paint my work. I have been asking a lot of time, do you have people paint your work? And I say, I spend all my knowledge. I just wanted to understand why this brush is so important than the Chinese arts. And this is very hard to learn. I'm not intimidated by it because when I was six years old, I'd been punished with a brush writing, I, I have to do my homework, I have to do my homework 100 times, 10,000 times with a fine brush. But I don't understand culture as a Chinese myself because Hong Kong is so westernized. I have resist about resistance of Chinese culture. But once I moved to North America, then I started to understand why it happens to me. So I go back and now I'm in between. <laughs> no, it's perfect. One thing I Steve. would say about, um, you know, we haven't sat down, Wayne and I have talked a bit because we've spent, we've actually overlapped some, um, but Sin, Sin Ying and I have never actually sat down and talked about it. But I think that when, whenever I speak to somebody who's been to China or has worked in Jingdezhen, I think there are a lot more people who are um, getting those opportunities. It just takes a second to, to really come to a commonality of your experience there. Because you, you can say, hey, you know, that mold maker, that was, he was something else, right? And they know exactly where you're coming from and just the appreciation for skill and, and um, you know, the, the resources there. But I think the other thing that became really clear to me today is that what ends up being such a unique part of your own experience is how you interact with the people. And, you know, all of us have had a very deep connection with uh, folks that we've met there, other, other artists, other craftsmen, and that changes it, you know, so it's not just about um, how great is the porcelain, it's, you know, the people there are just amazing. I mean, it's a very different uh, perspective and generosity, I think, that exists that, um, that uh, you know, I, I still think about today. Uh, do I, any of you have anything else you'd like to add, or we can throw it open? to some Q&A from the audience. Well, I thought it was interesting what you were saying um, and uh, thinking what it must be like for you to be there. Um, and in contrast, of course, to my experience, because I was coming from Alfred, um, with the older, you know, well-known ceramic art. Um, you know, one thing that, that really uh, meant a lot to me was trying to develop qualities of communication when you don't speak the same language. And I know you've all had experiences as if you travel at all, you travel to Italy, you don't speak Italian. But going to a city of makers, there was a language base that we all have. <laughs> so you could sort of do a little bit of you know, theater or something, <laughs> and people, what? or you would laugh. Laughter is kind of a universal language, and or we draw something, or we would find ways. And I, I thought there was such deep poetry in this that, without 
you know, what is kind of traditional communication, that we were able to have a kind of penetrating level of communication because we were makers and, you know, I would be astounded by a skill. And not just that someone would do that for me, but that I was really admiring of their abilities and we could talk about that without the language. And so there was this, this bond, I think, that happens for people who are makers like myself in going to a city like Jingjichen where that sense of communication and the depth of that communication and a sort of poignancy that's beyond the work, but you know, you know, I kind of know, we know we're artists, we're craftsmen, we are makers, you know, we're changing the world object by object. <laughs> that's a real deep and powerful feeling. And I think part of my emotional connection has to do so much with that with my friend Yayo Khan, who's my same age, I didn't speak Chinese, he didn't speak English, he spoke some Japanese and some Russian, and immediately we were connected in a psychic bonded place that was in some other zone. It's like we had crossed the threshold, went through the membrane, and just knew. And it's just been like that for so long, a deep, deep friendship where the communication is very rich and very poetic about people and experience and um, that I think is the maybe the the most uh, poignant uh, sense. You know, I was trying to communicate that with my little journal. I'm leaving. You know, he's coming to the to the airport to talk to me for two hours about ch Chinese philosophy, and we don't speak <laughs> the same language. <laughs> and he brings me this little wonderful sculpture, and I'm le I'm leaving, and I'm going. I love you. I do just love you. And I know he knew what I was yelling at him, what I was walking across this rainy tarmac to get on this plane to leave. And who knew when we would see each other again? But that's a very deep feeling um, about Jing uh, where that sense of the maker's paradise is sort of is there. And it's grubby and it's industrial and they're tough, rugged, conditions and people have to survive and but that sense of the maker's place is um, thrilling. It sounds like um, there is no other place on this earth that that quite has the same feeling. Well you have to be a ceramic it's a, it's a, person. <laughs> well, for, I, was, I was going to say and for, maybe there's for a painter's for paradise a ceramics, or a but I mean I, I think it's, it's actually it's a painting paradise too. It is about painting. Okay. Because, a lot of painting. But yeah. There is something about the experience of being there that has, from, from my inexperience of not being there, looks to be very profound. Um, it may not be obvious, uh, it may be introverted, it may be uh, subconscious, but all three of you seem to have taken amazing amounts of um, feeling and, uh, and art back from Zheng De Zheng. But definitely I do feel that um, the medium, um, uh, we don't, like Wayne or my Philip Witt, Philip Witt, my husband, they don't speak the language. But once he holds a brush, it seems that the art forms or the making, the process, bring the language together without knowing how to speak Chinese. So I think that is what I really experience with spending time with my husband and in the city and why he got so popular because he doesn't speak Chinese at all. But because of, he has understanding of the culture. He has the appreciation and knowing the art. So that's, I think it's beyond language. But I struggle because I'm going, I know both languages and I know subtext of what is behind. Mm -hmm. So it's very different, yeah. So my work was thinking about what is actually, you know, communication is a language. One thing I noticed when I was there too um, is that there some people would come in with the mentality that that you're working for me, I can act however I want, and there's an expectation that you're going to do what I say, and you know it was very I thought disrespectful, and I think that something that is very clear about the way that like Wayne and Sun Ying operate in that realm is that they're they're incredibly respectful of the individual, whether they're a painter or a thrower or whatever it might be, and 
and I got into this too because I think it's easy to shift into that mentality where, you know, I went to the glaze shop and I wanted this one glaze and they're like, oh, well, we don't have it. Why don't you come back tomorrow? So I went back the next day. Oh, no, I don't have it today. Why don't you come back tomorrow? This was like two weeks. Like I, came, I went back and they said, no, no, he really sounded like he meant it. You know, and my friend eventually was like, he's just, like I would get more and more angry every day and just, why wouldn't he just tell me he doesn't have this glaze? And eventually I think he got off put to the point where he was never going to give me this glaze. And it was like a real lesson just to, you know, like they're not, it's not like this, they're servants to you, you know, it, they're, they're like real people, you know, who deserve to be respected. And I think even this perspective of somebody who has a ceramic experience as a maker, like we go there and we're marveling at somebody who's considered like the bottom rung of the assembly line, you know? And I think that's another thing too, where suddenly there's this influx of people who are coming in and really va applying value to what they do. And, you know, that's a, I think that's a wonderful thing, you know, to, like if you, yeah, like I, there's so many things that I'd see, like little kids who could paint flowers, like that would take me years to learn how to do. And, you know, you can really just respect and marvel at that, you know, that ability for people to do that. So uh, we were gonna open the floor to questions and I did see a hand, yes. If you have a question, would you be so kind as to stand up so that one of our ushers can ha hand you a mic, that would be great. And then there was another hand in the middle, so if you can stand yeah, up. Yeah, uh, just a question, did, were, did you encounter contemporary con um, artists working in clay that mirror your own, um, sort of the privileging of um, personal expression, creativity, all the things that you, know, you bring? I mean, uh, in general, in this conversation, the Chinese uh, workers tend to be presented as you know craftsmen, as uh, highly skilled, and so on. But you know, we certainly have a lot of very high-profile pro contemporary ceramic artists. Did you also experience uh, uh, contemporary ceramic ceramic artists? You know, not not you know, uh, we have um, you know uh, Ai Weiwei or somebody like that. But you know, you, I would say you all are the Ai Weiwei's of the ceramic world because you know the ceramic world is. I think our way ways um, sunflower seeds were all made in Jingdezhen. But, I'm, but did you encounter uh, individual artists coming to, to or from Jingdezhen or coming to Jingdezhen who are actually Chinese exploring the sort of more yes, uh, personal there, communication? There are a large number of Chinese ceramic artists who today would be considered um, in, you know, in, in the conversation in a similar fashion to the three of us who are working as artists, so to speak, uh, as we differentiate that from artisans or skilled craftsmen. And the artists across China, uh, young people and older artists, um, are spending time in Jingdezhen, also accessing. And of course, Jingdezhen has a number of um, very well-known artists um, who have lived and worked there for generations who are Quite famous, uh, Yayo Khan, who I mentioned, considered by many the premier ceramic sculptor in China. Mm -hmm. um, Zhou Gozhen is an older gentleman. Uh, he's now probably 80. But the Chinese government made a postage stamp of his work. And he's worked and taught in Jingdezhen for generations, was very important in the school. The school there is... Um, a school that was started by the Ministry of Industry, Light Industry, uh, in probably 57, uh, that gathered up a lot of the history of the city and put it into a pedagogical kind of structure and also introduced ceramic engineering and science and taking advantage of the location. Um, and then many of the faculty of that school uh, became renowned uh, ceramic artists throughout China and then their students and what have you. So that today, um, they're in Beijing, they're in you know Xi'an, they're in Shanghai, uh, running programs, teaching, and there's a very strong uh, contemporary ceramic movement in China today. Okay, I thought I saw someone in the middle. Would, would you? Could you please wait till we get the? No, stand up, please, and wait for the, the mic. Thank you. My question was really similar, and, and so you may have answered it already, but going around our collection upstairs and also the Brooklyn Museum, there's extraordinary Japanese ceramics, you know, large pieces that are sort of 
one-offs. Is there a similar tradition emerging in China? Could you talk about one one-off? I mean, you know, the question is about studio pattern. You're talking about the, all these the, the studio pottery tradition, basically, and, and whether or not there is a studio pottery tradition. Mm -hmm. So I think Wayne sort of suggested the answer was yes, there, but maybe... The there are a couple two? of other issues, and my friend should chime in. But the, the contemporary movement in ceramic art really began in 91, 92, when I was there. And it was just that energy was beginning to start. And that has to do with a whole cultural dynamic of what was going on um, with the government and with the kind of permission to uh, do some things that would change the economy. The economy in China began to grow at that point. Um, and the Japanese, of course, have had resources economically for a much longer period than the individual Chinese ceramic artists. It's very hard to make ceramics if you don't have a kill, if you don't have a studio. And so all of this was attached um, to industry. But I think more difficult at the beginning, and it's growing and changing, and now the artist can access a lot of this communal firing and things. Um, but the economy and just the nature of the culture at that point, of the kind of politics and the general quality of life, um, was just, you know, that's why we've only seen the, the growth of contemporary Chinese ceramics since the early 90s. But the Japanese had a, a studio pottery movement of a very different ilk for a long time. Soshi Hamada, um, Kawai, the um, Minge movement with uh, Soshi Yanagi. Those were uh, connections, for instance, with the West, Bernard Leach back in the 40s. But I think the new generation, particularly like the younger generation, they really focus and because I, I taught there in the summer for a course and understanding that, that they have that, as Steve said in his slideshow, show, they hunger for everything. And uh, they, the systems just started to divide it into like ceramic design, ceramic art, ceramic sculpture. And, but they all learn a little bit things of a little bit of everything, but um, particularly ceramic arts, which is um, a program that started since Alfred had the uh, exchange with them, or uh, um, and then the teachers was uh, encouraged in the curriculum to start to have the student to learn um, glazings and do the whole process like the Western culture, Western uh, educations. But in the past, they're all divisions of uh, skill, divisions of labor. There's also some work that um, we, we've all mentioned, Caroline Cheng with the Pottery Workshop, um, which started in Hong Kong and then they opened up a, essentially it's a community studio like we might find in a city here. Um, but there's one in Shanghai, there's a gallery in Beijing, and then in Jing Jen is their, I'd say like the mothership, you know, of all that activity. And they have been really working hard to invite a lot of foreign artists to come and just expose those people to the the students within the community. So I think that has grown pretty significantly. And they're also, you know, they started these outdoor fairs where students can sell work, you know. And a lot of those things that we almost take for granted here, like, just don't really exist there. So, um, you know, one thing I look a lot at is, like, the, co the prices of some of those pieces that are being produced. Um, so in Shanghai, if they have this gallery with handmade object, like handmade cups or mugs, you know, the prices for that aren't near what, at least from what I've seen, they're not near what they might be here, or in Japan, certainly not. Um, so I think that there's, you know, as Wayne was saying, it's like, it, it doesn't seem like that's, it hasn't been very long, but it's moving at such a rapid pace. I mean, it's growing so fast in, in all facets. Actually, I'm, I'm gonna have to interrupt and be like an awful egghead here. But I mean, I think we are concentrating on one city in China, which is Jing Zhejian, but the Yixing ceramic tradition, which has been a studio pottery tradition where people have been signing their work, actually dates back to the 17th century. And there was a brief period in the late 19th and early 20th century in Jing Zhejian where people were painting on clay 
and signing their works. Um, and some of those artists are actually on view at the China Institute now. And then there was a whole other group that were carving porcelain in very interesting ways and signing their works. So I, I think we've, we're doing China a little bit of a disservice, um, largely because of the Cultural Revolution, in not realizing that in the late 19th and 20th century, when studio pottery was, was becoming a global concern. See, I told you I was going to be an egghead. They, they may have been there as well. Um, and I think we have time for one more question from any of you. So, yes? I, I did live in this city for a bunch of years, and not as a ceramicist, though. I kept hearing about this special clay. Have any of you heard of why Jing Dejen began? Because of the clay? That's what I kept hearing. The clay is kaolin, uh -huh. and uh, there is a site near Jingdezhen called Gaolin Mountain, which is a mountain of kaolin. It's a white firing clay, and it's the fundamental ingredient that allowed porcelain to be made. It's found in other parts of the world. There are wonderful stories about Georgia kaolin in this country where uh, Wedgwood sent his scouts and they were digging up Georgia kale and shipping it to England to make uh, Wedgwood. Is the red sand clay like the Georgia kale in them? No, red sand. There's a red sand, I think you may, might refer to a clay body that's actually Yixing, that's a red oh. clay that actually the government will not let you take out of the country. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a national treasure the the clay body that the Yixing teapot serve this red purple clay. Yes. Okay. I want to hear. But that's a, that's not a porcelain product. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much for giving us so much of your time, and let's thank our artists. <laughs>